We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are, are all united. united. Okay. Uh, well, let me let me begin. Um, I'm the president of the uh, Global Forum on Cyber Expertise Foundation, which is the only multi-stakeholder international forum for helping to coordinate and share knowledge within the community of international cyber capacity builders. I should also say my name. My name is Chris Painter. Uh, sorry about that. It's a little early in the morning for me here in Washington, D.C., and I'm sorry I couldn't be with you all today in, in Poland. For those not familiar with international uh, cyber capacity building, it's about projects where knowledge and skills are shared across orders to strengthen national cybersecurity or cyber crime fighting combating uh, capacities. Uh, this work is very attuned to the importance of online freedoms, human rights, and internet governance. So it's not just about security, it crosses over to those other pillars as well. There are at least a dozen specialist websites uh, the cyber capacity building community used to that act as libraries of useful information. Several of the teams who run those sites are with us here today, very happy to have them, uh, both on the panel and dialing in. We have two aims for our session here today. The first is to facilitate the sharing of ideas and good discussion between the people behind these websites, but also uh, with the people who use them now or could be using them in the future. The second of our goals is that it would be good if some concrete suggestions came from this session of how these websites could work together to improve the experience for their users and let more people know what's available for them and how they can use these powerful resources. This session builds on the IGF session back in 2016 on uh, fostering dialogue between internet observatories and maps. The session will start with a panel discussion and then I'll open the floor for people to share their experience and ask questions. We want to make this as interactive as possible. I hope we can find topics where there is a free flow of discussion between everyone on the call. Uh, so let me talk, first introduce our panelists. As I said, we have a distinguished and great set of panelists. And I apologize to people if I mispronounce your names. I often mispronounce my own, so sorry about that. Uh, Louise Mary uh, Harrell, who is a Special Digital Security Policy Advisor Advisor at Agrape Institute. Agrape Institute is created uh, by the Brazilian, uh, they created the Brazilian cybersecurity portal in 2021, so recently. Stephanie Borg Basala, editor of the GIP Digital Watch Observatory and chair of the Sybil uh, Steering Committee. Sybil is the portal for the GFC. And Dries uh, Kostelik, lead cyber stability researcher. Uh, security and Technology Program for Unidir, and Unidir established and runs the cybersecurity portal that Unidir has set up. Uh, Enrico uh, Calandro, co-director of the Cybersecurity Capacity Center for Southern Africa at the University of Cape Town, and senior research associate at Research ICT Africa. So let me start our discussion uh, by asking each of you uh, some questions, some targeted questions. Uh, Louise Murray, uh, you recently set up a new cyber policy portal in Brazil. What did you learn from that? And how did the network of portals help you setting that up? Thanks so much, Chris. Um, hi, all. It's nice to see so many familiar faces, but new faces as well uh, from whichever part of the world you're connecting. Um, thanks, Chris. Um, so just a, just a brief contextualizer. Uh, Igarapi Institute is a think and do tank that's based in Brazil. Uh, we connect global to local and global agendas on security and digital security is one of them. So throughout the years, we have been working a lot on establishing kind of gov tech and civ tech to support kind of the creation of knowledge across different areas, such as crime rates, uh, mapping gender-based violence across different cities in Latin America, uh, enabling access to information to refugees across Latin America as well. And in, you know, when we think about cybersecurity, it is often seen as a very thorny and difficult and perhaps not that accessible uh, kind of topic. It wasn't for certain when I started uh, researching this, it was really hard to find information. So 
what we found, at least in the Brazilian scenario, is that it's too complex and too technical. That is not just specific to Brazil, but I'm guessing like we share different uh, similar challenges here. It's fragmented in terms of roles and responsibilities across the public administration. And it's often criticized, at least in Brazil, for being very militarized. So how can we actually portray the multi-stakeholder aspect of the different policies that have already been developed uh, in Brazil specifically? So, uh, so we try to map this ecosystem um, and also kind of establishing the portal as a way of uh, making access to that kind of knowledge more uh, easier for researchers and policymakers as well. So as you said, you know, we launched the Brazilian cybersecurity portal in uh, 2021 at the beginning of the year. Uh, so how did the network help uh, help us in, in kind of pushing this forward? I've basically spoken to almost all of you at a certain point of the development of the portal. I think that's really important to ensure that we're not, um, you know, doing double efforts or trying to reinvent the wheel rather than in the process of developing a portal thinking about how can we establish knowledge that is accessible to a particular community but also speaking globally so the the portal is also in english so that was something that we wanted to do you know not only create knowledge that's situated in the global south but also in a way to communicate it externally and the network of portals was just amazing and just having that shared experience of what does it mean and think about the process of making that kind of knowledge more uh, easily accessible. So the Observatorio de Ciberseguridad from the OAS has overlaps with the Brazilian portal, for example. Uh, the UNIDIR portal has overlaps in terms of the Brazil profile over there. So it's really important for us to keep that communication open beyond just the interface, let's say. And the lesson learned for me, I would say, is that a portal needs to speak to the scope that it's covering, right? So in that case, we were really diving deep into the national ecosystem. And the idea, you know, you can see timelines in other portals, but in our case, we not only created a timeline, we created like a network representation of the different actors and sectors and linking the different policies that they developed. So that is kind of the way way in which we could portray what was a national environment, which is very different from other portals. So always trying to contextualize that, learning from the other portals as well, but creating something new that can help us represent that kind of knowledge in a new way. So I'd say these are the two points. Yeah, thank you for that. And it's, it's interesting that just a few years ago, uh, there weren't any portals or there were or the portals were in, in I, I think, far uh, less developed stage than they are now. So Certainly, I share your, uh, you know, your original concern that there was hard to find stuff out there, but it's good to have these things out there now. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, Stephanie, you're, you're the chair of the Civil Portals Board and work on the Digital Watch website. Uh, how do you see you know, the state of cooperation? There are a number of portals out there, which I think is good. Uh, lots of flowers are blooming, but you also want the garden to work together. Uh, so how do, you see, how do you see that going uh, from your perspective? Thank you, uh, Chris. Hi, everyone. It's good to be uh, here with you. Yeah, as, as uh, you both were saying, Chris and Louise, a uh, lot of flowers in the garden, but it's important for the gardeners to be able to work together because the garden is big, so <laughs> lots of work to do. But um, to answer directly your question, um, uh, state of cooperation is looking good. Obviously, there is more work to do, um, uh, but the um, um, there are early very good signs um i would say so so that's the uh short reply to your question a bit of a longer reply uh is the following so i um as you're saying i represent the um, um uh, both sites so the civil portal which is the gfc's portal is um a library of almost 800 um international projects so that's a lot um it's a very rich site uh with um uh, uh, projects, tools, publications. Um, um, so all these resources on uh, capacity building, and it serves as uh, um, um, as a good um, uh, tool for uh, practitioners working in cyber capacity uh, building. Um, uh, digital Watch is a little bit different, I would say broader in terms of the coverage of uh, digital policy, because it looks at um, over 50 uh topics uh, under the the broad definition of uh digital policy um and uh, there's also the aspect of resources um uh, not so much the focus on 
uh, capacity building. I would say that's just one of the topics that are covered under the Digital Watch, but the idea is uh, a broad thematic uh, coverage. Um, in terms of cooperation, um, this is something that the um, um, Civil Steering Committee, and, and here I, I, I'm wearing the hat of the uh, chair of the Civil Steering Committee. Um, the, the steering committee is working, um, is taken as a priority, this cooperation between, among the portals. Um, and um, the, um, a good example was a good uh, coordination uh, call this year between Sybil and the Unidir's website. Um, and uh, uh, I would say we, we appreciated the fact that they um, uh, let us know their update plans um, beyond the interface. Um, and uh, created the shared online spreadsheet in our table so we could see the new resources um, that they're adding to the site. So that's um, uh, very much uh, um, appreciated. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the cooperation is there. Um, uh, the idea is uh, um, even when it comes to new portals, which um, do uh, pop up every now and then, um, the idea is not to reinvent the wheel, um, avoid duplication of efforts. And that is why uh, cooperation um, needs to be strengthened a little bit. Um, and the portals, at least the representatives of the portals need to um, come together every so often. Um, but I'll, I'll, uh, a few more ideas further on in the uh, session. So back to you, Chris. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. And, and I, you know, I think that you raise a, a, a good point um, that all the portals are not necessarily scoped in the same way, which is important because they don't have to be. It's just interesting. It's important, though, for people to know what the portal is meant to encompass, what its focus is, and when you cross link between them to make sure that people understand that, because there's a lot of things that people want to find out in this area, not solely capacity building, that's certainly an entree point for a lot of it, but not only that. I should note um, for folks on the call, if you've not looked at the chat, there are a couple, I think, important things there. One, Kathleen from GFC, Kathleen Bay, has posted uh, links to each of the portals from our speakers. Uh, so if you're interested, and I hope you are, please uh, check those out after the meeting, after we're done. Uh, and then uh, the other thing uh, that uh, she notes is that when we we're going to have an open discussion in the latter half of this meeting, so please have questions ready. Uh, use the raise hand function so that we can uh, we can call on you and have that discussion when we get to that point, or at least phrase your question for the panel. Um, so Andy, let me, let me turn to you next. Uh, you work on Unidir's cyber uh, policy portal, uh, which you recently updated this year. And indeed, I know we're in the process of updating Sybil as well. Do you have any uh, lessons from that update experience, which often could be trying, I know, in terms of any of these things, uh, and listening to the experience and request of your users, because I'm sure that's, a pro that's part of the process of updating is what works and doesn't work and what serves your, your community. Sure, thanks. Thanks for the question, Chris, and um, for your dedication to moderate this in the middle of the night. I'm quite impressed. I'm grateful also uh, to the GFC to to bring the community of portals together. I think this is the first time that we are all sitting together for this event, and of course, um, to the IGF for providing the platform. Um, updating the CPP and um, so the policy and legislation profiles of the states is essentially a constant process for us and for the team behind, behind the separate policy portal. The information that's gathered on the portal has been evolving almost pretty much daily since the beginnings of, in, in 2019. Um, this year alone, I think we're close to 140 updated profiles this year. But yes, there's a there's a there's a different side as well of the of these updates. We update also the functionality, user interface, and so on. And we've made a lot of improvements uh, this year um, to the portal. For us, the feedback of the users is obviously the, the driving force of the changes and improvements for the for the user interface and, and functionalities. And thanks to our users, we have actually identified um, their, what they may be interested and not. And one thing that, that popped up this year was the views on international law. It's a subcategory that we have um, added recently to the portal. And it's quite popular uh, with uh, visitors. I mean, Having said that, first and foremost, CPP is a confidence building tool. So it's facilitating transparency. It's aimed at reducing potential misunderstanding among the, among the UN member states. It's something that has been recognized by the OEWG and GG in their reports um, this year. So 
I bet it doesn't come as a surprise that um, if I say that states are the most important target audience for us, but this views on international law, for example, the collection of the views uh, provided by, by, by nation states um, has been, has been um, requested frequently actually by, by the research community. So we try to, we try to serve them as well. Uh, of course, we have to constantly prioritize and um, although the team behind the CPP, so several policy portals, sorry, um, has, has some quite futuristic ideas uh, for the future. We have to balance with our capacities, the capacities of the development team and the potential impact, obviously, of, of each of these um, improvements. I guess the most important lesson would be to actually listen to the users. I know that sounds a bit obvious and I apologize for that, but I theorize that that's probably not as far as much as it should be. Um, it's quite easy to get caught in the excitement of new things, new features creating new features just for the sake of features with themselves um, while actually being disconnected probably for the, from the from the target uh, from the target audience I think I think that would be it for now so I mean a couple of things you said obviously are interesting I, you know one is just the constant push to make sure you're updating and, and this has been a, a banner year in terms of countries talking about uh, how they view international law for instance coming out of the the GGE where that was one of the uh, voluntary tasks that a number of yep. countries did. And second, uh, you know, I, I think you, you make the, the point that listening to users, it ties in very well with this theme. We just had the GFC just had its annual meeting. And the theme of that was a de more demand driven approach uh, because we see this in capacity building too. You know, it's great for us to have all these capabilities that we offer people, but if mm -hmm. it's not beating their needs, that's kind of a mismatch and it's not helpful, especially when we have limited resources. So, so thank you for that. Well, let me finally, um, <clears throat> Let me go to Enrico, uh, and then I'll go to more general questions. Uh, you use these portals as a researcher and as a project implementer. So from your perspective, what's your experience uh, with, with using these portals and what difference do they make to your work? Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris, and, and hi, everyone. Um, so my experience with these um, cyber portals, both as a, as a researcher and as a project implementer uh, has been uh, overall positive. Um, so from my perspective, um, they, they are useful for three main reasons. Um, and those are uh, research, uh, dissemination, and as instruments for um, cyber capacity building and training. So um, let me explain you why. So, uh, First, of course, um, they are useful for, for research purposes because, um, as, as has been said, they uh, aggregate, organize, and, and make available uh, research, uh, analysis, and also data sometimes. So they can be useful for mapping existing um, policies on, on digital issues and on cybersecurity. Uh, they can help identify gaps uh, in policy and regulatory uh, development and allow to zoom as well in specific countries or, uh, or regions. So um, they can support both the, the thematic analysis of cybersecurity uh, issues, but also understand the, the geopolitical landscape on, on digital and cyber policy. Uh, and finally, uh, when uh, research analysis and data have been collected and organized, longitudinally when that happened, they allow also to understand developments also across the sector of time, which is a very important one. Um, second, they are also useful for dissemination purposes. And that's really important from a researcher perspective because they really allow uh, researchers, academic and other um, think tank organizations, for instance, but also government in some cases and private sector, why not, to reach a wider and specialized audience. Um, for instance, just to mention a portal that is not part of this, um, of this, this discussion, the African portal, which is widely used by uh, research ICT Africa and maybe researchers doing research on the African continent. It works as a virtual hub and a research repository, which includes expert analysis on African affairs. So not only cyber, but broader African affairs. And um, what is good of that is that it publishes and promotes research and analysis on different African issues from different think tanks uh, and, and thought leaders, academics, researchers, journalists, industry experts um, on policy issues on a variety of, um, of fields. And because it is open access, um, is an open access research repository, very important, I believe, for dissemination of research, 
It holds, it holds um, reports, occasional papers and policy briefs, which are available for free and full uh, text download, which is not always the case, especially for with academic publications. And, um, and all the publications are provided by the partners of the African portal. And so it really allows for this wider dissemination uh, of their research for an African and even global community. And, and, and third, uh, I believe these portals are really useful as instruments, as we said, for cyber capacity building and training. Uh, for instance, Cyber has got a full section of, of tools and it really allows to filter content by themes, topics, tags, type, actor, year, and therefore to access a highly specialized knowledge on a number of important issues related to, uh, to cyber, um, digital policy issues and, I, and other highly uh, specialized area uh, related to, to the work that we do. Uh, I would stop here for the moment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. And I, you know, I, I, I take your point about not everything is available in full text form. Since I, since I switched to starting to write some articles recently, I found that to my surprise, <laughs> that's not as always easy to get to those, those things. Uh, if you're not uh, a, a full-time academic. And so I think it's very helpful to have that. Um, let me let me open up the aperture a little bit and ask all the panelists a question. So, you know, I ask any one of you to jump in. I ask you, you know, make this conversational. So, you know, we've talked about the value of these portals. How can we work together to promote these websites and help users know what information is available to them? What what is what kinds of things can we do to to encourage that? And and this is an open question to any any of the the folks, any of the four of you. Uh, I'll, I'll volunteer to jump uh, first, um, Chris, because it, it sort of builds on what um, I was saying earlier. Um, so uh, perhaps two suggestions from my end. Um, I think it would be good to have a virtual meeting one or um, regular of portals in 2022. Uh, so essentially it's bringing the portals together and um, just sharing uh, updates um, and plans. So an open, let's say an open channel of communication among the portals. Um, um, and um, related to this, very related actually, it's um, joint uh, communications. For instance, um, a newsletter by um, uh, once every two months uh, uh, portals a uh, month and um, here I have an example from uh, Geneva which is um, where the G our Geneva internet platform operates from um, obviously and uh, there's a good example of a newsletter called the Geneva platforms and essentially it uh, it's not thematic, so it um, uh, brings uh, updates from the different platforms that exist in Geneva, and once a month um, it uh, publishes all the updates from the different platforms. Um, so we're involved because of it, because of digital policy, but the teams are are varied. Um, uh, so the the thing that binds them together is literally the word um, platforms, um, but there could be something similar for. Uh, portals, so essentially portals um, uh, the, the, with, with different um, teams, different um, scopes, uh, and just having updates there um, for, for people to see. So those, um, throwing out those uh, two suggestions. Uh um, let me just jump in and, and uh, sorry, Chris, uh, is it okay? I, yeah, no, no, okay. that's great. That's exactly what I wanted. Great. So. No, that's great. <laughs> I mean, uh, so I just wanted to add like two really quick points because I think uh, there are two dimensions to how we can think about, um, you know, promoting each other's kind of work. I think obviously there is the internal coordination uh, between different portals to ensure that we're not, as I said, like reinventing the wheel and seeing how we can potentialize the synergies that we have. Um, so that's that is one element of that, but there's also kind of the external element. And one thing that I think was very useful, uh, especially our, our chats with like Unidir throughout this whole process was, you know, to reference each other's work. Uh, be it in social media, whenever we're promoting kind of each other's work or, or just ensuring that, you know, we can have a page in our own kind of, uh, you know, portal 
portal that kind of references other portals. I think that is a low hanging fruit, which is basically linking things and creating like a static page uh, because we know like building portals also includes like having the funding, having the capacity to actually you know, update it continually. So I think, you know, just having a cross reference across different uh, portals is also a very low hanging fruit that we could do uh, and actively kind of promote that and kind of just say periodically, oh, these are the other portals that are available out there. So these two dimensions, I think, would play out very well. Great, thank you for that. Uh, others? Yeah, just to jump in to what Luis uh, was saying, um, I support um, what she was saying on, on referencing these portals, and that's really important also from, from a researcher and research perspective. So to add the reference in your piece of work to, to, to the specific portal, it would uh, increase their credibility. And of course, the community reading uh, your work would see where, what's the source of your data and on your information. That would have certainly uh, an important impact on uh, on promoting the use of these uh, portals for uh, for research purposes. And second one, um, also try to increase as much as possible the instruments for interacting with the uh, with the wider community behind the, these portals. So the possibility of submitting your work, of reviewing periodically. I mean, uh, we should not underestimate the power of users able to, to to review the work or information on data that has been published on these um, on these portals. Of course, that needs to be done somehow in a specific and structured way, but that should not be underestimated. So I believe that to provide instruments and possibilities for the wider community to interact um, with the portal by um, double checking the data, updating the data, publishing their own work uh, and information, again, uh, will be very important for promoting uh, the use of these portals. Great, yeah. Yeah. Andy. Me as well, yeah, I don't want to be the, the, the only one <laughs> on, this, on this question. I think one thing that um, keeps coming to our minds, to be honest, is the, the fact that um, these portals to a degree um, have a different purpose and different audience sometimes, not always, I understand that. Um, as I said, CPP, so cyber policy portal, sorry, is a confidence building tool, but we do know the usefulness of, of the portal also for national capacity building efforts or research purposes something that Enrico was, was emphasizing. Um, but at the same time, we recognize that we can't be the jack of all trades and we don't wish to be. Um, that's why we have a dedicated session, yeah, other resources and thanks. <laughs> thanks Louis Marie and uh, Stephanie for mentioning our outreach and, and collaboration uh, efforts, uh, efforts in the past. So I think that is really helping our users to look what's beyond what we offer. Because uh, again, I don't think we and I don't think we want to offer offer um, everything. And then another thing is perhaps we should cooperate more in our um, outreach and user engagement activities. This today is the first example of this, and uh, I applaud to the organizers. But um, perhaps we should we should tap into our networks a bit more and make use of them in, in promotion of our portals. Great. Well, thank, thanks for all good suggestions. Um, are there, you know, as you look at the landscape, we, you know, Andy made the point that there are different focuses, and that certainly makes sense. You know, you don't want everyone doing the same thing. There are overlaps, that's inevitable, and that's great. But are there, you know, as you look out there, all of you and the, the websites, the portals that are out there, uh, are there, you know, I think you've all said there's a bit of overlap, which is not necessarily bad. But are there gaps that you'd uh, you'd identify? Are there things that you'd say are not being covered that we need to make sure we're we're taking account of, or is there overlap that you find is not helpful? And again, uh, anyone anyone could talk about this. Well, I can jump in. I think on um, on the gaps, um, definitely. I mean, I'm totally biased here, uh, but I definitely think that uh, we need to think more about you know national portals, regional portals. I think that is a very interesting way of bringing or linking, for example, let's say, you know, a civil or, you know, a higher level kind of portal such as UNIDIR that's trying to map, you know, policies across different countries and kind of territorialize it to like a particular context to kind of bring more and then we can start linking better kind of these different knowledge pockets, uh, pockets of knowledge. So the other point that I would say in terms of what I think might be a, a point of attention 
in thinking about these different portals. I think both cyber norms and kind of mapping APTs, so advanced persistent threats, state-sponsored cyber attacks, are two of the key kind of thematic elements that I see that get a lot of attention. And there are lots of different kind of initiatives mapping that, which is great. They are really important. But I do think that sometimes we are kind of over-creating. There's like different emphases, but Perhaps these are two points that have been capturing a lot of attention, rightfully so, but it might be a place that we need to consider, like how can we le leverage what's out there uh, instead of kind of continue creating these mapping efforts of different uh, norms and also different uh, APTs. So that would be my two cents. Okay, great. Any other thoughts from folks? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of build up on, on what Louis Marie said. Um, I think in general, we need to be reactive to what's going on around us. Um, so what's going on in cyber policy discussions, what's happening in the UN uh, processes, well, no, it's one process. And we're, I'm pretty sure we're gonna see see certain gaps, gaps emerge. Um, speaking from experience here, we do not start with views on international law, the collection of these uh, national views on the applicability of, of international law to cyberspace. And yet we, we saw that there's a, as I mentioned, demand and also the, the heating debate, I suppose, uh, within, the, within the UN processes dedicated to ICT peace and security. So I think that was, that was our, our attempt to fill in the gap, but I'm pretty sure others are going to emerge. I mean, Louise Marie had two examples. I'm pretty sure that's gonna be something else as well. Right. Um, yeah. Any other thoughts? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, maybe quickly, Chris. Um, in terms of, of gaps, I, I agree as well with um, with Louis Marie that um, probably there is a need of working more on uh, on national or regional um, portals. We we are also receiving requests, for instance, of developing specialized portals on Africa, um, digital policy uh, developments. You know, it seems that African stakeholders would like to see. Um, something like uh, like that, probably because it's it's a you know very specific geopolitical um, uh, region with its own characteristics, and therefore uh, it would allow to really have this kind of uh, both the thematic in depth and regional focus on the developments of these um, of these regional um, issues issues related to 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 to, to cyber. And, but the second point is also, I think, um, one has to be careful and mindful of the sustainability of some of these portals, because, of course, here we are dealing, you know, with the GFCE, UNID, that they've got the resources capacity to make them sustainable. And as Andres was saying, to update them daily, meaning, meaning that there is at least one resource dedicated exclusively to that kind of work. And this is of paramount importance, especially if they use for policy purposes. We find ourselves sometimes using the data and information on that portal, and if it's not updated to the latest one, a policymaker would make a comment. Sorry, you are not saying what is actually, and rightfully as well, right? I mean, well, somebody so they always need to double check somehow. Now, to have them probably highly specialized at the national and regional level would somehow allow maybe to fill in some of these um, knowledge gaps that might be there related to the difficulties on updating, on update, upgrading and updated, updating them. But at the same time, there is always need of understanding whether the model is sustainable because you know you can have a once off exercise, a portal that is up and running for one year, but then what about you know in future? And that's really, really important. So that's an aspect I think it needs to be always taken into account. Yeah, I, I look. I agree. I think that's not an easy task, and I think probably that's the the most resource intensive of any of the portals is just keeping them populated and up to date, and and uh, especially when the, with the changing environment we have. And you're quite right; they lose relevancy if they're not as up to date as they can be. Uh, so that that is something to to that, that's a concern and something we need to look at as a gap. Uh, any other uh, thoughts on that? And I'll, if not, I'll move to the last question. Any other thoughts? I, I do, um, Chris, and this um, this aspect about the resource intensive um, uh, need to keep the um, content updated is something that, um, and now I'm wearing the hat of the Digital Watch Observatory, is something that we felt too. Um, uh, it's, um, you know, the, the larger or the richer the content on the portal, the bigger the resources uh, needed to keep those updated. 
um, we have a team of, uh, um, at the moment, around 30 specialists who look at the content uh, every day. But sometimes, and, and that's a, um, I acknowledge that that's a, a large group, but sometimes it feels it's not enough. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the um, um, since we look at digital policy from such a broad uh, perspective, um, it's it's a challenge to keep up with all the developments simply because it's so dynamic. Uh, there are developments every day. Uh, so going to even regional and national levels, um, that's a huge jump. Um, so the, the, the resources required for that is are even, even more, um, you know, they, they have to be very large. So in terms of sustainability, um, for the portals, I think, um, uh, you know, some, some um, uh, serious uh, thinking is required. I mean, for, for anyone um, thinking of uh, setting up a portal, it's, um, it's no joke and some serious um, uh, uh, thinking and funding also is required for the resources. Yeah, so I'm I'm gonna... go ahead, sorry. Uh, no, I just want to uh, want to mention the 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 resor the the funding aspect because um, basically you need money to keep the um, to you know you know the experts needs to be uh, compensated for the work. Um, it, it's natural, so um, there's a lot of funding required to keep things uh, moving along. Yeah, I'd say two things. One, you know, look, I know many in this community. I think all all in this community are really passionate about the subject, so they. they want to work and want to volunteer as much time as they can, but um, you have to, you, you do have to fund and resources. People can't, people have to live. <laughs> so, you know, it's an important thing. And even in the, uh, and it's not always that easy uh, raising these funds, especially for these topics. Uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we can mainstream cybersecurity and cybersecurity capacity building more after this year when it's gotten more national and international attention but it's always a hard issue and it's something we need to call more attention to and that's a larger discussion about how we can tap into the larger i think development community to think about this and i will tell you that even even um when i was in the government where we were just trying to keep our own website updated uh which people would use researchers and others would use for authoritative positions unlike the u.s government that was really hard so it's not you know it's it's governments to share the same issues too and a lot of our information is drawn from governments well, let me let me move to the last open question, and then we're going to open it up uh, to questions. And there's already been a number in the the chat from the audience. If if there's something that you um, could ask of the wider community or another organization that would make your job easier, what would that be? And answer if you want to. Don't if you don't. We have we we can move into questions too. So this is kind of an open question. If there's something you would say, I think a number of you have talked about this already you know, funding, resources, um, uh, discussion, so you don't, you know, more discussion between the portals, I think it will all come up, but if there's anything that hasn't come up, please, please say now. Can I start? Yeah. Um, one thing that Enrico sort of mentioned, and I think it came came up in, in recent discussions with, with various organizations that we collaborated with, is is this um, if you notice if you notice perhaps that there's an issue on our, our cyber policy portal on a specific profile, feel free to feel free to raise this this with us. We're by, by no means we are perfect. We get a lot of information from the government, but, but from the government, but nonetheless, a lot a lot is also um, done through a lot of the profiles are updated through desk research. So I think um, that would be a flag, flagging of an issue would be immensely appreciated. That's one. And second, I think it's quite clear. Um, also, any 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 potential issue that we may have with a user interface or you know the request for a new new functionality, something like that. I think all these things would be immensely appreciated. We actually have a have, have a, a dedicated feedback form on our website. Um, we get quite a lot of information through that. Uh, more and more so, to be honest. And I think uh, that's something that um, I'd encourage people to use. Not only not only my fellow panelists, but um, anyone that may be interested in this area. Sure. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry, Chris. Uh, hey. I, yeah. No. Go ahead. No. No. I just said great. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, no, I was just gonna add to to what Andy was saying right now because. Um, one thing that, you know, as soon as we launched, I think there, there are two things here. Like the first one is, you know, how do we 
build these places where people can actually feed into and goes back to Enrico's point, we actually have a feedback, not a feedback, but it's really like a data input form. And people have really kind of reached out and kind of said, I don't understand. Why are you two mapping more cybercrime nationally? So, you know, and that is really interesting because it was like from people in the federal police that were working with these things and reached out through that particular element and thought that they could kind of add to the experience of mapping, you know, the la national landscape. And one, one thing that I think, you know, we're really, really open about is that we're not trying to kind of be, uh, you know, exhaustive here. We're really leveraging the knowledge of these experts. So I think, you know, looking from that perspective just gives the user so much more power to kind of build collectively this uh, knowledge base. And the um, and the other point uh, would be definitely kind of to to bring, uh, as I said, you know, how can we communicate better? Uh, you know, the the different. Uh, national developments. And because, you know, as I said, you know, in Brazil, for example, like cybersecurity and cybercrime are very much related in terms of roles and responsibilities. I mean, that's not exclusive to Brazil, but just having that perception and being able to communicate that externally is it's absolutely amazing. Uh, so, yeah. Great. Um, well, I wanted to yeah, maybe. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, please, Chris. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, very. Um quickly on, um, on, on this. Um, so I think it's also important to consider sometimes not to, to duplicate efforts that are already in place. Um, just to give an example, um, when we used to conduct that research, ICT Africa, our uh, ICT access and use survey producing these um, big uh, data sets on, uh, on a number of African countries, you know, we found ourselves in the um, in the position on whether we should have our own dedicated portal for that highly specialized data set or maybe to use another portal. And we decided to use another one, another repository that has got already a number of data sets simply because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There is somebody that does the job better than us. We do research, collection of data, curating the data. Let's do that rather than you know to add a component of portal. So from our perspective, it would, would have been as was better at that point to decide, okay, let's collaborate with the port and let's let be part of that repository. You, you know that what it does, it's highly specialized on data uh, repository from different sources across different teams and, and organizations. So I think that would help the community, considering that there are already existing portals uh, that do you know that kind of job of aggregating the kind of information let's rather use them because there are already, as we said, probably team that, you know, do that kind of work of aggregating um, data and, and information. And secondly, I'm wondering also up to what point these portals can be used also for um, in internal tools. So not only as you know, an interface for the public, but somehow also to benefit uh, internal um, communications or work that is done at an organization level. I guess the Unidir portal probably is used by Unidir researchers for their own uh, purposes. Similarly, I'm sure that the Cyber portal is used by the um, um, GFC community and the GFCE team as well for their own research. So sometimes I see again duplication. So using a portal for their own internal purposes, internal communication, and the external one for the broader audience. So I'm, I'm wondering if sometimes it would be better to merge this kind of two processes and, then you, 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 and to use you know, one um, point of access, both for internal and external um, issues. Well, and, and also, as, as it was pointed out in the chat, to, to share practices on how these portals are being set up, what the back end looks like, uh, as you say, you know, what features they have, I think is useful. Uh, both because one could serve as a, an example to another, but also in the duplication point you made. Well, well I'm going to open up to the audience for questions, and and both uh, questions from people who are dialing and want to share their experience running uh, or using a specialist cyber portal, or uh, or a participant that might want to say what they they find most valuable, what sites they find most valuable. We have a couple that have already a couple of questions that have already come up um, uh, from from the chat. Um, and one of them uh, from Carolyn Weisner is, uh, do we have any way to know how many users the websites uh, in the Capacity Builders Network have in common? Is there a lot of overlap? Um, does anyone have a good sense of that? Or is that something that's sort of, uh, at, the at this moment, unknown? 
Um, Chris, when it comes to uh, the overlap, um, uh, all right, the number of users visiting a website, that's easy to know because there are tools um, such as the, the um, analytics um, uh, to, to tell you that. When it comes to users overlap, that's a bit difficult because the analytics will not tell you who the users are. Um, plus, there are all sorts of data protection issues, so you can't really um, first know. And second, even if you do, which is very difficult, um, um, I don't think that um, um, it's 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 even possible to to share um, uh, information about that, um, you know, with 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 other portals. Um, but uh, the Caroline's question um, brings to mind the point of the user awareness. So in terms of numbers, how many users use uh, each portal, I think that's very useful to share. And I can tell you immediately that the um, Sybil portal, um, it grew from um, 1,000 users a month to 3,000 users a month last year. So that's a, a significant um, um, uh, um, increase in the number of users. But still, we feel that that's not enough there we we think that there are still a lot of people out there who um, can benefit from the civil portal but still don't know about it so there is um uh, i personally feel there's an issue of a uh, uh, lack of awareness so there is no one space online where you can see um, or at least i'm not aware of it where you can see all the different portals out there um what there is um and um it, it's just been published is a study that uh diplo carried out um, and it was funded by um it was actually mandated by the uh, GFC and uh, um, funded by the government of Canada. Um, it was a gaps analysis of uh, cyber capacity building tools. And we did a review of the portals out there. So um, somewhere there is a list in the study um, which, which, which is online. Um, I know it's not the same as having it on a portal, for instance, having the list there. Um, but, anyway, but, but my point is that um, one thing that we found um, uh, in conducting the study is, again, the lack of awareness of these tools, um, including the portals. And um, we felt it is a bit counterintuitive because there is um, uh, so much information out there. You know, we're, we're, we receive emails, we're on social media, we're, we're, so, we're exposed to so much information, and yet still people don't know about the different portals. So there's a lot of perhaps noise um, and the, the, the useful information about the portals is not getting through to the people who need it. Um, uh, the study focused on, 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 on diplomats, that's true, but I think it's um, judging from the number of users that Sybil has, I think it's um, uh, a more, let's say, generic uh, issue about the lack of awareness. So that's something that um, when we think of cooperation among the portals, that's something that we can also uh, build on. Um, for instance, the portals internally, um, even if not here, this is a um, public um, event, but if uh, portals getting together and sharing the number of users they have every month, seeing how the number increases, seeing how they can work together to promote the other portals, why not? Um, uh, um, this, is, this is part of the cooperation, right? Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, okay, so back to you. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that. I think that it is hard to see what the overlaps are. I take your point. Um, and, you know, sort of this cross promotion that several of you raised in the beginning of the session, uh, I think is helpful for awareness purposes. And another is just to get a sense from users what they find valuable and what they don't, and maybe even what other portals they use, you know, as you do surveys or feedback from users. And that's really the second part of Caroline's question. Is there do, you, do any of you have an example, I'm sure you have many examples, but one that you'd like to say today, of a user that found your uh, portal particularly helpful for doing their work and, and how did it enable their work in the end? So you know, this, this is a value proposition. Um, now, we, we don't see that just by the numbers who come to the portal, but it's more the feedback we get either orally or, or written from our users. But uh, anyone have a story they want to tell? Don't all jump at once. <laughs> I'll, go, I'll go again. It's, but I must disappoint you. It's not a story. I'm very sorry about that. Um, 
it's a bit of a bullet point list of things that I think was quite rewarding to hear. Uh, we have quite a lot of testimonials on, on, on our social media platforms from a variety of users. So be it government, researchers, private entities or private sector. So I think that is that's something that's quite rewarding uh, to know that we're on the on the on the right track. And second, which I understand it's very context specific or very cyber policy portal specific, but um, uh, I need to repeat um, the fact that we were explicitly um, mentioned in the um, uh, OEWG and GG reports of 2021 was a big uh, big recognition also for the portal. And I think the fact that we are on the on the on the right track. Those are two, unfortunately, again, not a story, but um, still quite useful, I suppose. Right. Anyone else want to jump in? All right. Well, I, I do think I do think that I, I mean, at least I've heard from many people that these portals are very helpful, and, and when I, you know, uh, and and useful because uh, if they know about them, this goes back to the point. You know, they, they have to know about them first before finding them useful. But but I've heard from many people that these collections which have different focuses, but are very helpful. The GFC one, you know, certainly the capacity building communities found that helpful because of the number of products, uh, the fact that they're updated and they deal with such a range of topics has been very helpful to them. And then part of that is, you know, as, as you know, a lot of the chat uh, I'm seeing now uh, deals with some of the technical issues of setting up a portal. So there's the actual content issues, but there's the, you know, the back, the back office, the back room, how do you set them up? And and uh, one little conversation between Louise Marie and uh, Robert Collette um, is uh, is exactly on this point that you know just just the technical aspect is useful to share among people, but Robert makes I think a very interesting or Louise makes a very good point that um, you know when you set up a security portal like for instance the GFC uh, you're instantly subject to a lot of attacks on that portal. So you also have to think about security issues too. So Louise, I don't, Louise Marie, I don't know if you want to talk about that for a moment. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is something that, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, like when you look at it from that perspective, right? Uh, uh, in, in, a, in a sad way, but in a good way, let's say. Um, and I think, you know, setting up a portal just involves so many dimensions as, you know, a researcher, project coordinator kind of a function, uh, you know, you have to over oversee all of these things and you need to kind of plan knowing what you need to plan for. And just having this conversation across different portals about, you know, what you need to include when you're thinking about setting a project for a portal is absolutely fundamental. And I don't think sometimes we consider like uh, the, the security or having, you know, a budget, a part of our budgets that actually covers security for that infrastructure that might possibly need to be a little bit more sophisticated than your usual kind of uh, security uh, uh, of your organization, let's say, or of different portals that you've set up. So I think, you know, having that in mind, mind, which is a very kind of mundane kind of technical aspect, is very important when thinking about bridging, you know, uh, research aspirations of what kind of knowledge you can put out there together with what do I need to actually make sure that this platform, that this portal will be sustainable. And, you know, independently of like different, uh, you know, uh, backgrounds or different regions or different funding capacities that you might have, that will allow you to plan in a more concrete way of what you can achieve with the funding that you do have. Uh, obviously, we do, as as Andy said previously, you know, we can have like beautiful, futuristic kind of plans of how we can visualize things in a very interactive way. But, you know, what can we do to optimize what we have right now and have these criteria very laid out? So I think this conversation is one of the types of conversation that would be useful for a network going forward, you know. Well, let me let me raise that question since we're we're getting toward the end of our time and I, I've been told in advance we have to end on time absolutely uh, by our organizers. Um, you know this has come up a few times and it seems to me it's a good idea, but I really want to get your guys' sense of this. You know, this meeting to me has been very helpful uh, just in sharing information. Uh, would it be helpful to have a, a, a more formal virtual meeting of portal managers in 2022 to share notes, share experiences? You know figure out um, what they have in common, what they need to build, what some of the deliverables are. Would that be something that would be useful to organize? I see a thumbs up from one of our panelists. Anyone want to address that? 
Stephanie, you want to start? You did the thumbs up. Well, I know Louis, Marie, you, a couple of you done, but Stephanie, let's start with you. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, um, um, definitely. Uh, yes. Um. I think the question is who is going to take the initiative to organize, and I think it's something that uh, the the civil steering committee can initiate. And there has been uh, there has been already um, um, work um, by uh, Kathleen, Robert, Carolyn, those and the steering committee itself. Um, some let's say building blocks, some elements on uh, for this. Great. Uh, others on the call. Yeah, absolutely. I think perhaps one way of thinking about this is you know we we start a conversation here about what kinds of things you might consider when setting up a portal independently of you know the funding that you have you know maybe think about this you know laying out both the back end and and the content kind of end uh, and trying to kind of communicate that with a wider audience that's interested in, in building their own portals just sharing that information structuring it in a way so i think that would be something that would kind of focus the work of these conversations beyond just sharing best practices which i think it's really good but tying that to perhaps, you know, the work that the GFC has been doing, I think that is a very interesting way of just structuring, you know, ideas around uh, cyber capacity building from the perspective of the portals. Right. Well, I think I think the, uh, the, the steering committee and the GFC can take that on and, and we'll be in touch on that. Uh, just in, in one minute or less, well, actually less than one minute, just 30 seconds, what uh, any other concluding remarks you guys have before I kind of wrap it up with some concluding remarks and recommendations? If you have them, you don't have to have them, but good. Anything else that anyone wants to add? Well, you know, thank thank you for this. It's been a very uh, rich discussion, I think. And, you know, the GFC is certainly very pleased to support this event because that's really our raison d'etre. You know, we're all about trying to help organizations coordinate and share information in support of a better international cyber capacity building agenda, but also, you know, help all these other things, as people said, the, the regional approach, the national approach, the more focused approach. And there, there are a lot of things I heard in this meeting that I think are, you know, as we said, it's always nice to have a meeting where you have concrete recommendations. And there were a lot of them, everything from collaborating in terms of the back end of portals to cross promotion, to linking between portals, um, to, to really awareness. I think one of the key things I heard from many of you was just making sure people are aware of this and making sure these portals are actually useful and current and the updating issues and the resource intensity of that. But also I think that cross communication will help with that as well. So, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot on this in terms of what, uh, you know, I, I've used several of these portals myself and I always find them very, very helpful. Um, and this is a relatively new concept, but one I think will grow as people become more aware of it. And we go into, you know, additional sessions, both in the UN system and regional systems and the GFC community. Uh, these will uh, turn out to be, I think, even more valuable for folks uh, as, as, as resources. So, you know, a couple of the other issues is, as I said, placing more signposts on portals to other websites in the network, I think are helpful. Um, we mentioned doing more joint communications on our sites. Um, for example, the GFC magazine could have an article on the network of websites and talk more about that. We've had you know some point of that in one of the in the last issue, but go even further on that. And you know, I do think there's a, a lot of support to have a call in 2022 to get folks together. And I welcome suggestions both from our panelists and from other people listening to this call on everything we've talked about today, how we can strengthen this ecosystem and how we can take this forward because this really, I think, is meant to serve the larger community, but it's also a community effort. So with that, I, I wanna bring the panel to close. I wanna thank all of our panelists uh, for their, their great comments, but also for all the work they put in because you know it's not just showing up on a panel. It is all the work you're doing both behind the scenes and in front of the scenes, which I know is not easy, uh, but is much appreciated by, you know, uh, I thank the entire community. So thank you for that. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks Chris. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.